I, I talk to a lot of people online. I follow a lot of the sort of other sort of indie hackers and stuff. And, and a very common thing that I hear from people is, I'd love to do a, a SaaS product. I'd love to build something as a side hustle, but I just don't have the time. Like I, I've got a full-time job. I've got family obligations. I've got friends who want to hang out. At most, uh, I've got like an hour a day I could spare where I could work. And, you know, and people are like, well, I can't build something in one hour a day. So I was like, that sounds like an interesting challenge. Hello and welcome back to Indie Bytes, the podcast where I bring you stories from fellow indie hackers in 15 minutes or less. In this episode, I'm joined by Mubbashar Iqbal, but you might know him as Mubs. Mubs has made over 90 side products during his career, so I was interested to see what it takes to come up with ideas and to build things so quickly. If you're like Mubs and make a lot of projects or share links to your projects on Twitter, the sponsor of this episode will be perfect for you. Mugshot Bot automatically generates unique, beautifully designed images for every page on your website or blog, so you don't have to worry about them. This means you can focus on what matters, building your product and creating great content. Mugshot Bot is a tool that I use personally and is made by another indie hacker, Joe Mazzalotti. To level up your link previews, go to mugshotbot.com forward slash indie bytes. Link is in the show notes to create an image for your site completely free. Let's get on with the episode. Mubs is a prolific maker who started over 90 projects. Currently, he's building Founder Path from Nathan Latka and on One Hour SaaS, where he spends one hour every day working on a SaaS business. Mubs, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? Yeah, very good. You start a ton of projects. When did you start out building businesses? Yeah, so I started tinkering with computers when I was about eight years old. And so since about eight years old, I've been playing with that kind of stuff. And that led to a software engineering degree. And then ever since then, I've just been interested in just creating things from ideas, really. And so the first few years was just spent learning as much as I could, not just about software engineering. And I think I did my first side project it was in somewhere in 2001, I think was my first side thing. <laughs> Blimey, 2001, a long time ago. And since then, you've launched over 90 things. You've been product hunt maker of the year. You're pretty relentless when it comes to shipping things. <laughs> First of all, how do you come up with all your ideas and how do you distill that down to what you're actually going to work on? Yeah, those 90, just to be clear, those are just things I've made for fun on the side. So that whole time since you know I've had a full-time job. So usually my things on the side are just things that you know, I'm passionate about or I see there's a pain point out there or somebody reaches out to me and has an idea and they pitch it to me essentially and say, hey, Mubs, I'd you know, love to build this. I'm not an engineer. I don't know how to code this stuff up, but I'd love to see this exist. And if it's something that interests me as well, then or it doesn't always have to interest me. But as long as I see that it interests the, the person who's pitching it and they have a real passion for it, then that's usually a big indicator that I should help them out as well. You say they're all side projects, they're all for fun. You must make some revenue from some of them. And obviously they cost money to run. And you've got yeah. a few on your site that are on autopilot. Those ones <laughs> that are on autopilot, how much money are they costing you to keep running? And do they make enough money to justify it? So I think all in, I spend probably about a $150 a month in terms of hosting. And then in terms of domains that I own right now, I probably spend something around probably a thousand bucks a year on that. So yeah, so as long as they cover something like 20 bucks a month on kind of average, they've covered the cost of kind of hosting and stuff like that. And frankly, if I have one that does quite well or is sold to somebody who wants to buy it, I typically cover the cost of all of my other things. So I'm like a mini venture capitalist. They start 20 side projects, you sell one and it covers the cost of all the rest of them. <laughs> Interesting then. So those that you you do sell, how do you go about getting them to a place to sell? Uh, Helen Riles on the podcast uh, a few episodes ago, who's similar. She started a ton of projects and she's she sold a few of them. So for you, what do you ever set out to get them sold? Do you get approached? Do you list them up for sale? I don't typically go into them thinking about I want to sell them because like I said I guess we didn't really talk about it in terms of the ideas and stuff a lot of them are just built because like I want to learn a new tool or something like that and rather than just following the sort of online t tutorial or whatever I sit down and I actually build an application with that particular tool so I get a real understanding of kind of how it works and with kind of a real life kind of thing how do you ship things so quickly? Do you have a, a certain amount or like a certain set of tools you use? Yeah, no, I try and stick to stuff I already know, except if I'm trying to learn something new specifically. Uh, so for example, I think Options Worth was something I built a few years back, 
which was my first attempt at building like a view application. I started just at the beginning, just like everybody else. I was using things like Bootstrap and jQuery. That's why a lot of the sites look the same because you're using the same components, the same elements. Now, over the years, you know, I've transitioned to using Vue and now using Livewire as well. Uh, moved away from Bootstrap and now use Tailwind on the front end. And, and frankly, a lot of the reasons that I move is because those frameworks, those libraries do make it easier to ship stuff and ship stuff that looks good and works well as well. What, what's been your most successful project? I don't know how you want to define success. Some of your products went viral, robots take my job, a lot of them 900 plus upvotes on Product Hunt. What ones have been most successful and how would you define success? I think you have to think about why you're building something in the first place, right? What counts as success? It depends on why you why you built that thing. So I think in terms of going viral and just traffic and just exposure to me as a kind of person, which I think was one of the main reasons I started building side projects in the first place was, you know, I was working at an agency and we couldn't really talk about the work that we were doing because we signed NDAs and things like that. So I started building side projects as a way to build stuff and then share the fact that I built this thing so I could talk about it and the work. So will robots take my job was probably the most success, successful in terms of giving me that kind of exposure that I wanted. I think it did like a million page views when we sold it a couple of years after we launched it, it had done 14 million page views. And then there's just been a few along the side that, you know, just got sold at the right time that helped me buy something or have a holiday that I wasn't expecting and, and, and things like that too. Let's move on a little bit to what you're doing now. You've got Founder Path with Nathan Latka and you've also got One Hour SaaS, which is a sort of project you're working on. How did Founder Path come about? Yeah, so Founder Path, like I said, I think I've been doing that with Nathan now in various forms for about 18 months. It started off as just a, a friend of mine from Austin introduced me to Nathan and he was just looking for somebody just to help him build just like a quick little side project thing. But yeah, so that, that was just one of those like side fun little projects that, you know, that 18 months ago we just spent a few hours a week working on and has now become this thing that we're doing full time. I say full time. Nathan has a lot of things that he's doing. I have a lot of things I'm doing as well. And so, yeah, we're spending eight, 10 hours a day on it. You're doing it full time, but you've also got a bunch of other things that you're working on as well. <laughs> yeah. And for those that don't know, what, what exactly is Founder Path? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Founder Path is a new way of SaaS companies to get access to capital without having to give up any equity or, or kind of anything like that. And so Nathan ran a, a pretty successful business while he was still in college and exited out of that. And then he started a podcast where he actually interviews SaaS founders and, and they talk about all the sort of ins and outs of how to run a, a SaaS business and how they're doing and stuff. So people asked, started asking him for intros to for ways to raise money and to grow their business and eventually that kind of turned into this idea well if you've got a, a stable business that's got a successful a, a pretty stable client base why are you raising money by uh, selling shares of your company to a VC or something like that where you lose control and you lose kind of equity so Nathan came out with this this way of basically saying look we know that you've got a sustainable business how about I lend you the money based on the fact that I know that you have a stable um, he ends up making more money because he gets more than he would get if he put it in the bank and or, or bonds and, and kind of stuff like that it's less risky than putting it into the stock market it, it started being a win for both him and the sort of SaaS founders and then once he proved that model for himself, he then was like, how do we scale this out? So I, I basically came on board to automate that process of how do we verify people's SaaS income and their customer base. We look at their retention, their churn, all of that kind of fun stuff. And we try and automate that as much as we can by connecting to their Stripe accounts and any other accounts that they have. What's sort of the benefit of going down founder path versus just going the bootstrap route or maybe even raising well i guess with raising traditionally with vc you give them away equity and yeah. it's harder to get money from the bank because they might not understand SaaS and they don't understand revenue. SaaS at all yeah <laughs> why would you go after a founder path loan versus just bootstrapping once you've figured out you know how your SaaS is positioned in the market and stuff Often you just need some capital to go spend on Facebook ads or to hire somebody. And so you just need that little bit of infusion of capital to help you get up to the next level of the 
business. And in the past, like I said, the sort of options that you had were fairly limited in terms of how you could access that. And so with something like Founder Pass, it allows you to access that based on your track record of the customers that you have. And you, know, you get to maintain control over your company and keep as much of it as you already have. But then you still get access to a way to accelerate your company as well. Let, let's sort of round off on the other project you're working on at the moment, which is One Hour SaaS, where you're building podcast ping at the moment, if, if I'm right there. Tell me all about what, why you wanted to do that, Mubs. <laughs> so normally around this time of the year, I usually start thinking about one more side project that I'm going to build between now and the end of the year. And it's usually not like a quick little weekend hack. I usually think about something that's going to take me... A few weeks is going to take me a month or two, perhaps. I decided that after building 90 plus projects, I wanted to do something that was a little bit different. And so I, I talked to a lot of people online. I follow a lot of the sort of other sort of indie hackers and stuff. And, and a very common thing that I hear from people is, I'd love to do a, a SaaS product. I'd love to build something as a side hustle, but I just don't have the time. Like I, I've got a full-time job. I've got family obligations. I've got friends who want to hang out. At most, uh, I've got like an hour a day I could spare that where I could work. And, and you know, and people are like, well, I can't build something in one hour a day. So I was like, well, that sounds like an interesting challenge. I just sat down and so I was like, how about we, we try that? We'll see if you can just work one hour a day can you build a SaaS product? Can you build the product, but then also build, like, can you do the sales and the support and everything like that in just that one hour a day? I started with a blank slate. I, I did have a few ideas that I had in my back pocket that I was thinking I was going to make one day. So I worked through which idea I was going to build. And yeah, so ever since September 9th, I've been working one hour a day and I've been posting on YouTube a quick little 10, 15 minute video about what I did in that one hour, what I was working on. Yeah, it's, it's been awesome to see. And t tell me about podcasting and why you're building that. Yeah, so podcasting, I was trying to come up with an idea that would work for the challenge in terms of something that wasn't completely off the wall, but also something where I might have some kind of inroads already in terms of the industry and the audience as well. So I didn't have to like build an entire kind of audience for it in the first place. So since I, I do run uh, Pod Hunt, which is a kind of a podcast discovery service, I figured building something in the podcast space would be interesting. Uh, I came up with this idea of a podcast ping, which is... People have these monitoring services where they check if your website is up and available. But I realized that there wasn't something like that for p podcasters. And yes, you have your website for your podcast, but you also have your RSS feed for your podcast. You also have the MP3 files that you need for your podcast. And nobody's really doing a good job of kind of checking if all the different parts for your podcast are all up and, and available. Uh, so yeah, so Podcast Ping is a monitoring service that's built specifically for podcasters. Uh, you'll be able to add your podcast and then we will kind of keep an eye on your ISS feed, your website, your MP3 files, make sure that all parts of your podcast experience is going to be up and available. Mubs, you did say before we started recording that there's no way we're going to fit it all in and we're 25 <laughs> minutes in and we could go on for hours, but we'll wrap it up there and we'll go on to a few quick fire questions. So the questions are your favorite book, favorite podcast and who's an indie hacker we should follow? favorite book I, I think it's funny i recently read that built to sell and i think it's not so much the sort of steps involved but the like the mindset that you have to switch from when you're building something for yourself to actually thinking about how do you remove yourself from the thing that you've spent all of the passion on and how do i put my things on autopilot and i think a large part of that was was stuff that not that i read in built to sell but stuff that yes you know, some of the stuff that i thought about but once i read built to sell i was like oh this is a good idea this actually makes sense podcast i mean i love the indie hackers podcast it's awesome there's so many people on there that have done really some really inspiring things including you, know, you twice ideas. Yes, I've been on there twice. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I've, I've worked with a lot of people in terms of, you know, over the years. I love what Ben Tossel is doing on MakerPad. I think just exposing people to the no code movement, I think is really awesome that people don't have to reach out to me now if they have an idea with something because there's enough tools out there now that people can really create things on their own. It may not be exactly what the idea that they had in terms of what the finished thing is, but to be able to make something and have it out there and not have to rely on kind of other people, I think is, is really awesome. Amazing. Mubs, thank you so much for, for joining the podcast. No problem.
Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Indie Bites. If you did enjoy this episode, I'd love you to share the episode with just one indie hacker that will find it useful. It does help the podcast grow. As always, you'll find links for everything discussed in the episode in the show notes. That's all from me. Enjoy the rest of your day.